today, but he sends his regards. And as is the custom of my people, I will also be reading my paper. Mediterranean and Near Eastern big digs of the 20th century are a significant source of information on the ancient world. Because of their broad scopes, however, managing and presenting their data, both archival and born digital, is complicated. Recording and interpretive systems evolve over decades, and changes in personnel result in shifting priorities and the loss of project oral histories. Today, we'll provide a comparative perspective on the challenges of digital documentation and data presentation from two big digs. The Poggio Civitate Archaeological Project, which began in 1966, and the Archaeological Exploration of Sardis, which began in 1958. Both are still running. They provide excellent case studies for how long-running projects manage their data and present it to the public. Due to the project's consistent leadership and the prioritization of presenting information to scholarly and general audiences alike, they face complex challenges managing legacy data with newly discovered finds. And today I will discuss the ongoing curation effort that juggles analog records with an evolving digital system. Both projects are linchpin sites for the study of their respective cultures. Poggio Civitate on the left in ancient Etruria, located just south of Siena, and Sardis, capital of the Lydian Empire, east of Izmir. The investigation of each site has been crucial to shifting and enhancing our modern understanding of these ancient peoples. Both Poggio Civitate and Sardis have benefited from long-term directors at their helms, and this continuity in leadership has, in turn, allowed for continuity in recording practice and interpretation. I will start with Poggio Civitate. It began as a small team of graduate students and a large group of local workmen before becoming a field school in the 1980s, and it remains a field school today. Poggio Civitate is a unique Etruscan settlement with two major phases of occupation in the orientalizing and archaic periods, um, and then it was never inhabited again after the final destruction of the site in 535 BCE. It was the site of an elite residence, a religious structure, and a massive workshop. The two core elements of Poggio Civitate's documentation system are the field journal, or trench books, and the object catalog, both of which are entirely paper until the first iterations of an electronic database in 1997, followed by the full incorporation of a custom design SQL-based system, first implemented in 2001. Interesting with, or intersecting with these are maps, architectural plans and renderings, object illustrations, and photography. Poggio Civitate took a bold step and became the first excavation in Italy to make its entire catalog of artifacts, along with scans and electronic transcriptions of field books, visible and searchable online. This did not simply get posted as is, however. The push to move paper content into a digital format based on an SQL database was wrapped up from the beginning in presentation online. The summers of 2001 and 2002 were spent hand typing catalog cards in a basement into the database, as well as transcribing and digitally photographing all field books, also in a basement. It was an amazing opportunity to find errors, inconsistencies, and missing information from 35 years of field work, and my master's thesis serves as documentation of this process. In 2006, we made the data online and public, incomplete and still with errors, but with an explanation of our scope and goals, which you see here. The process also highlighted the incompletely codified tacit knowledge held by directors and early excavation team members. However, the database and the software for it were not maintained or updated regularly after 2007, and by 2016, only a few laptops had the Microsoft Internet Explorer 6 browser necessary to use it fully for adding new field documentation. We were so relieved to have the old paper archive digitized that we were not focusing on keeping the digital infrastructure robust enough to deal with rapid technological change. In 2012, the Poggio Civitate project began working with Open Context to disseminate their data. Open Context publishes data from several projects, now over 120 in number, in different stages of preparation. Open Context also archives data with the California Digital Library and secondarily with the Internet Archive. The Deutsches Archäologisches Institute also mirrors Open Context. 
and it has emphasized API, web services, and linked open data for interoperability with several other humanities and science data sharing initiatives, including Pelagios, Vertnet, which is a major biogeography data source, and others. So migrating data to open context also helps to network Pojitivitate in a broader landscape of research data management. The vast majority of data published by Open Context goes through an ETL process, meaning extract, transform, and load. Generally speaking, data need checking and cleanup before publication. The Open Context team uses OpenRefine to do this and connects with OpenRefine's API to obtain data loaded from relational databases and spreadsheets. Open Context has additional editorial interfaces for schema mapping and vocabulary alignment. So in all, ETL workflows migrated 47,000 images, 11,000 uh, trench book transcriptions, 12,000 object context records all into open context. And while it's a fairly large data set by archeological standards, the ETL process required extensive discussions between Eric Kanza with open context, Anthony Tuck, the director of Poggio Civitate, and myself who at that point oversaw the cataloging work. Discussing this effort helps highlight some of the challenges inherent in long-term data management for big dig style projects. First, the Poggio Civitate project had evolving expectations for data. The original SQL database emphasized documentation of individual objects and lacked controlled vocabularies, instead relying on free text field to describe the collection, and old user interfaces also emphasized keyword searches for the retrieval of individual object records. Open context, on the other hand, emphasizes more structured data and controlled vocabularies. Migrating the Poggio Civitate SQL database involved defining and implementing a controlled vocabulary for the project. The Poggio Civitate vocabulary is now linked with the Getty Ar and Architecture Thesaurus, the British Museum's Thesaurus, and uh, some Wikipedia articles as well. We developed the vocabulary first by identifying unique words and phrases in the SQL database's free text fields and counting their frequency of use. We use these word lists to create mappings to a more normalized controlled vocabulary. Secondly, as we noted, the legacy database stopped getting regular maintenance following 2007, and over the years, it had grown organically in complexity with over 50 different tables and a bewildering, for lack of a better word, array of integer identifiers all lacking documentation. Some of these tables had only a few records intended for use um, uh, board for aborted or incomplete features, or orphaned records with no relation to data in other tables. Therefore, understanding the database schema required reverse engineering the web user interface to understand how query parameters passed via URLs related to different identifiers in different tables. While these challenges made the ETL process into open context much more time consuming, they highlight larger issues. It shows how difficult it can be to sustainably maintain custom one-off databases for single archaeological projects. Finally, the issue of sustainability also manifests in how data are created and used in the first place. The Poggio Civitate <coughs> project devoted enormous efforts in the digitization and transcription of field notebooks, um, and these provide the main source of information about stratigraphic context at site, particularly in early years um, prior to the more formal documentation of single context recording. The trench book transcription effort resulted in over 15,000 HTML documents, and this HTML contains stylistic markup and links to related content in the legacy SQL database, including links to object records, other trench book transcriptions, locus forms, etc. Unfortunately, these HTML transcriptions were tightly coupled with legacy database and the user interface. They were created with legacy Microsoft tools, so their HTML did not conform to open standards. The hyperlinks in the transcription HTML required custom JavaScript, uh, JavaScript code to execute. Migration of trench book transcriptions to open context did not preserve all of the original styling and functionality. However, for nearly 15 years, researchers used the old version of the trench book transcriptions. Their use of the legacy data system then informed their research and publication of several articles, books, and dissertations. For these reasons, 
Eric used identifiers from the old database to generate URLs for submission to the Internet Archive's Wayback Machine. The Wayback Machine archived the legacy system, its JavaScript, the original HTML, um, and its style sheets. And the archive is actively developing better indexing and search functionality for the Wayback Machine. So future researchers will be able to explore the Poggio Civitate excavation record as it was first expressed online. Because Poggio Civitate was such an early adopter of web data sharing, we imagine this will be an important resource for future researchers interested in understanding the development of digital archaeology itself. Now to move on to Sardis, a site which has also benefit from consistent leadership. Um, I have to say first though, comparing Poggio Civitate and Sardis is a bit like comparing apples and oranges. Uh, Poggio Civitate is a relatively confined site, um, destroyed in a major conflagration, never inhabited again. But Sardis, on the other hand, has a much longer multicultural history and covers a massive area. The components of Sardis' recording system, however, um, are essentially identical to that of Poggio Civitate with maps and plans, a fieldbook archive, and an object catalog. Sardis' approach to dealing with digital data, however, um, uh, in, underwent an entirely different process and had a very different aim. Sardis' data was converted from a paper archive to a series of independent databases, is now managed using FileMaker, and the scale is pretty serious, including 20,000 objects, another 24,000 coins, and at this point, something like 273,000 photo records, just to name a few. However, the digital turn did not occur with web publication as a primary goal, and data vetting and cleanup has been driven primarily by conventional publication practices. Therefore, online presentation of the material is publications focused, beginning with material from the 2010 Lydians and Their World exhibition, and looking to add additional monograph and published report data sets and essays as we continue to vet the data. Just like Poggio Civitate, a lot of information about Sardis' history resides in the human archive and not the paper one. Digitization really reminds you of this problem. And a number of things are not generally intelligible even to the educated public or even to members of the team itself. And here's the thing we often forget. We are constantly creating new legacy data. Every generation of archaeologists believes it's being more conscientious than the last when it comes to record keeping, but we are all guilty of not annotating as we should. And it is only in the digitization and publication process that we realize how information is present but not explicit or necessarily findable. Dealing with outside specialist data adds another layer of complexity to the situation, and both Poggio Civitate and Sardis have invited specialists in zooarchaeology, human osteology, neutron activation analysis, to name a few, um, and making sure not only that specialist data can be integrated with the excavation system, but also that the specialist has the proper identifying information for objects in the first place. My co-author Eric has joined several other colleagues in a large qualitative study of archaeological data management practices called the SLO, spelled S-L-O, data project, which highlights how specialists often read context information um, from handwritten cards like these you see here in a variety of styles, and the journal Advances in Archaeological Practice will publish some of these findings very soon. Or in this case from last year, dealing with the publication of NAA data from Sardis on open context. It's only when I was able to see the data set provided by the specialist that I realized that there were a number of mistakes, um, usually from the misreading of tags or from Sardis specific annotations. Um, on the left, you see, it's a bit small, what the specialist provided, and on the right is my updated version with a number of corrections. And this reminds us that data curation is ongoing and is a never-ending need. Specialists will need continued guidance on how to best use paper records and to relate them to digital records. So now, ultimately, after my intervention, we can integrate the open context data with our own Sardis website and feel confident it will match up, thus enriching object understanding and presentation. In conclusion, the big digs um, that have played such an important role in Near Eastern and Mediterranean archaeology will require significant and continual investment in data curation. Data curation is very much a social practice, embedded within the norms and expectations of often tightly lit knit communities of colleagues. The case of Poggio Civitate offers a fascinating insight in the challenges not only digitizing decades of documentation, 
um, but also in migrating digital from one system to an entirely different infrastructure. Poggio Civitate was an early pioneer in using the web to share data, but the landscape of expectations and information systems changed, prompting migration into open context. The Sardis expedition has different publications, priorities, and conventions, and these have helped shape its digitization and database development priorities as well. Sardis's current data-heavy publications load drives the curation and codification of the archive, both paper and digital, and its data sources are much less integrated and granular than those of Poggio Civitate, with an emphasis on synthesis. Internally, it has always relied on yearly excavation area and material specialist reports, and this is reflected in Sardis's own web presence as one of synthesis and narrative about the site in its many phases. In order to be able to present raw data to the public, these syntheses must be unpacked by those with intimate knowledge of the archive. We're beginning to do that, and our soon to be published volume of coins will be accompanied by 8,000 coin records searchable on the website and ultimately linked to the American Numismatic Society's Nomisma identifiers. We want to participate in linked open data initiatives, and this works well with coins. In conclusion, how big digs handle the, handle the digital turn is often entirely wrapped up in the particular humans involved, and this human capital is necessary for untangling the methodological and situational decisions made over decades of archaeological work. In both of these projects, all the data is there and it is findable, but making it intelligible to other audiences is another matter entirely. Likewise, digitization does not happen once. It happens many times, and choices must be continually reevaluated as technology changes in order for these archives to be sustainably preserved. Thank you.